Hey guys, this is Brandon with iFast University. Um, we had more and more content from now on, getting you guys some stuff. Um, my area is really neuroscience and physiology, so we're going to start with some of that today. Um, I know throughout undergraduate, uh, at least in, at our university, um, we get talking about proprioception and it's just kind of, hey, you have muscle spindles and they detect length changes and all this magic happens real quick and you know where you are. Uh, and it's actually a little bit more than that, so that's what we're going to get into today. Um, so we're going to define some things real quick, and then we'll start applying it to teaching people exercises, a little bit of injury and rehab, um, and how we can take advantage of these different parts of proprioception. All right, first we've got to really define three big areas when we're talking about proprioception, uh, or later on what we'll refer to as position sense, not just proprioception. All right, so first we've got to define proprioception, and kind of the classical book description of this is my conscious or unconscious awareness of how my body parts are in relation to one another, right? So how is my lower arm positioned compared to my upper arm right now? I can say, hey, I know my elbow's at about 90 degrees. There's our proprioception. Right, our next term to define is this fancy word kinesthesia, right? And that's just our ability not only to sense position of the joints and the limb uh, segments related to one another, but also how are they moving, right? So as my arm is extending, how fast is it extending? What's the rate that I'm extending it at and where's it at in relation now to my upper arm or my torso? And then our last one, exteroception, is our awareness of the position of the body in relation to extra personal space, right? So how far away or how close am I to this whiteboard? Uh, how far are the walls apart where I'm getting sound feedback and I'm getting some auditory cues? Um, so we got three big things here right, that all start to feed into this bigger idea of position sense, right? So like we said, it's more than just, hey, I bend my arm and these muscle spindles do this magic and I decide where I'm at in space. Uh, we start to have to take into account all three of these things and then we can talk about position sense or proprioception um, as we get away from the book term a little more. And our last uh, important distinction here in the introduction is our proprioception and kinesthesia are internally generated uh, stimuli for us. So I'm getting feedback, I'm getting sensation from muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs and receptors in the fascia or in the joints or in the ligaments. Uh, so these are all internally generated signals that I'm getting. And then the last part here, our exteroception or externally generated stimuli. Right, so I have to have something bounce sound back from these walls or I have to bump into the whiteboard and I get stimulus from that. Right, so our three big things here, two of them are internally generated, one of them is externally generated, and we lump all three of these together, and now we have position sense. So we know where our body is at, what our body is doing, how it's moving, uh, and how we're relating to things around us in space. All right, so now that we kind of defined our, our three big terms, our kinesthesia, our proprioception, and our exteroception, uh, we're gonna zoom in a little bit more on this idea of proprioception and kinesthesia. Right, so we said that there are all these signals are internally generated. Right, so that means I don't really need any stimuli from outside of me to generate these, these afferent nerve signals. Right? We'll get into afferent, efferent here in a second. Uh, if you're not super familiar with that, don't sweat it yet. Right, so our proprioception and kinesthesia, right, being able to relate our joints and their positions, our limb segments and their positions relative to one another. Uh, we got three big things here. Okay. Our first one, right, we said our relation of bones and joints. Uh, we have a bunch of different types of receptors that we can get feedback from, or we can get afferent signals from. Right? So we have receptors in our skin. So if I'm standing here and I decide to bend my arm up, the skin on the bottom of my elbow here starts to stretch and I actually get some feedback from that skin stretch and that helps me decide which way my elbow and my arm are moving. We have a ton of receptors in the fascia all throughout the body. Uh, we have muscle receptors, so most commonly we'll hear GTOs and muscle spindles that we get feedback from. We also have our last one is we have receptors in joints, right? So inside the acetabulum or inside the glenoid, anytime the humerus or the femur moves around, we get joint receptors that send us signals and say, hey, you're moving, your arm's going into abduction or it's internally rotating right now. Um, so we have all these afferent signals that gives us a ton of feedback anytime you move or you're sitting there statically about where your body is and how your body is relative to its parts. So we'll move over just a little bit. And here we got a, the side of a brain, so it's kind of like you're looking at me standing here like this. 
right? We have all these receptors that we just talked about all throughout the body, right? These receptors send afferent signals. So receptors give us a signal, it sends it into the spinal cord. That signal travels all the way up the spinal cord to the brain. Uh, for our concern, we'll just go with the, the sensory cortex of the brain. So there's a little strip right here that we're worried about. Um, once we get those signals there, your brain can decipher them and decide, hey, consciously, what is going on with my body? Where am I at? How am I moving around? Once we have some of that information, we can actually have an efferent signal now. So we can have a motor output to drive muscles to help us move. So we'll go an efferent signal from the primary motor cortex for our purposes, back the opposite way down, out the brain, down the spinal cord, and it actually now activates muscles so that we can move or act on objects. All right, so we just talked about all these sensory uh, receptors giving us feedback, right? That feedback goes from the receptor in the skin or in the muscle into the spinal cord, travels all the way up to the brain, brain deciphers what's going on, and then from that, we can actually decide what muscles to turn on, what order to turn them on in. Right, so I also have this motor output now going from the brain, the opposite direction, back down the spinal cord, out to the muscles so that I can move or act on an object, whichever way I need to. Uh, but if we start talking about movement that's really fast or ballistic, like Olympic lifting or sprinting, uh, this feedback loop that we just talked about is too slow for us to change our movement. So we actually have with this motor output signal going down the spinal cord to the muscles, we also get what's called an efference copy of that motor program, right? So let's say that I have somebody that's doing a, a snatch, for instance, and that snatch is really fast, it's real ballistic, so this loop doesn't have time to take place. So they do their snatch, they get a copy down the spinal cord to the muscles, they also get a copy to a different part of their brain, and then once these receptors actually give them feedback, so there's enough time, they can compare what they thought should, should happen and then what actually happened. And based on that, they can hopefully correct the next movement or the next rep that they do. Okay, so we just talked about our efferent, afferent signals. We also have this efferent motor copy that doesn't get sent to the muscles. It actually gets sent to another part of the brain. Right, so we have an efferent copy here. It gets sent to another part of the brain so that if I was doing something fast or ballistic, once I do have feedback from all these muscle or joint receptors, I can decide if my movement was what I wanted it to be or how correct or incorrect it was. All right, so that efferent copy also gives us a sense of force, heaviness, and a sense of effort, right? How hard did this feel? How heavy was this object or how heavy was my body when I hit the ground? And then how much force do I think that I'm applying to an object, right? So our sense of effort, think about this, if, I, if we blindfold somebody and we have somebody here that's blindfolded and they do a curl with 50 pounds and they don't know that it's 50 pounds and we fatigue their arm and then we say, wait 10 seconds and we give them 40 pounds, since they're fatigued, their sense of effort is probably gonna go up for doing 40 pounds now, even though they don't know that it's just 40 pounds compared to the 50 they did before. Right, so anytime we have fatigue, which we'll get into here in a little bit, any of these three can change because that fatigue makes my efferent motor copy seem different or I have a perception of it that's different. All right, guys, so we're going to add a practical component to all this proprioception talk we've been going over. Um, we've got Tony here helping us. Right, he's our, our expert front desk lady and office manager here at IFAST. Um, so typically, I'll see uh, a lot of people mess up when we put them into their split squat for the first few times. Um, so we'll have them get down into this lunge position with their knee on a mat. And I'll say, Tony, I just need you to set up nice lunge position, uh, get tall for me and try and stay upright, okay? And if Tony's perception or his body schema that we kind of talked about is off, what we'll see a lot of times, right, is if I tell my client to get tall or uh, get straight up and down, is we'll actually see Tony's leaning back a little bit, right? Uh, this is probably the most common mistake I'll see, and again, the misrepresentation of his body schema is a little bit off to him. Okay, so I may need to help him. So say, Tony, you, I might stand in front of Tony and say, Tony, you kind of look like this now, right? My back looks real arched. Um, then I'll have him go ahead and take a long breath out for me, Tony, and I may even position him with my hands a little bit so that we get him more upright. 
And if we have a mirror, it's even better because I can say, Tony, now look in the mirror for me. Right, everything looks a little more upright. I got a pretty straight line from his shoulder down to his hip, down to his knee. Right, and now he's upright and hopefully we can rebuild that body schema in his mind so that he knows this is upright instead of that previous position. All right, last part of our proprioception and kinesthesia uh, part of the talk. Then we're gonna actually move on to that other piece, the extraoception that we haven't got to yet. So we talked about having these receptors throughout my body, my skin, my joint, my muscles. And then we also have this efference copy of motor programs that gives us a sense of effort, a sense of heaviness, and a sense of force, okay? And anytime we take one or two or three of these away, it alters anybody's proprioception, right? So if we take the sense of effort from Tony, which we're gonna do here in a second, we we'll, should see that his proprioception is a little bit farther off in his arms, okay? So I'm gonna have Tony do here. Is Tony, go ahead and close your eyes. And we're gonna bring both arms up. And I'm going to position his left arm where I want it, and I'm going to have him hold it. So Tony's holding it. Not only is he getting joint and mechanoreceptor feedback and muscle spindle feedback, but he also has a sense of effort, right? He's holding his own arm there, so he kind of knows how hard it is. So Tony, go ahead and match with your right arm where you think your left arm is. And he's really, really close, right? Maybe less than a half degree off, just kind of from the naked eye. Okay, so we've given him as much of this feedback as we can get. Now the next one we're going to do, I'm gonna to position Tony's left arm again, but this time I'm gonna hold it for him. Tony, relax on me as much as you can. Let me do all the work. And I'm gonna have him try and match it with his right arm. And he's just maybe two or three or four degrees off from where we were before now, right? And go ahead and relax, Tony, open your eyes. So all we did was we took the sense of effort and sense of heaviness and altered them so he doesn't have this, this information anymore to compare what's going on with what actually happened. Right? So the more of these we can keep, the better off that person will be proprioceptive and kinesthesia wise. All right, so here's another thing we'll see a lot. I'm sure you see it too. Uh, when clients first come in uh, after their warm up, maybe they're in the first warm up set of their big lift for the day, is Tony go ahead and set up for us. All right, Tony's first few reps, see this a lot, may not look ideal, but he'll actually kind of self correct hopefully. And right, see this with a lot of our clients that have been here for a while. And hopefully they're looking a little bit better by now, right? And what's actually happening is Tony's able to take that efference copy, and last one, Tony, thank you. Tony's able to take that efference copy that we talked about on the whiteboard. He's able to compare it to the feedback that he's actually getting while he's doing the movement just a little bit later. And he's able to compare them and say, did that feel right, did that feel wrong, what felt off? He's able to self-correct after just a few reps. All right, so we went through proprioception and kinesthesia and this idea that I have receptors all throughout my body and joints, muscles, ligaments, fascia uh, that give me input internally so that I can decide what's going on, how my body's moving, uh, and the forces that are starting to act on it. All right, so our last part of this is this idea of exteroception. Right now we're more concerned about how is external stimuli to me giving me feedback so that I can decide better where my body is positioned in space relative to the things around me. So we have four big ideas here that add to this extraoception. We have vision, hearing, touch, and body schema and form that we'll talk about a little more here in a second. All right, so vision, right, based on my vision, I can decide, hey, how far away is this table from me or how far away is the camera from me? How far away is my hand in space from my face? How far away is it from my chest? Uh, hearing, right, we also get auditory feedback, right? If I'm tapping on the whiteboard, I'm getting some feedback. I'm hearing how long it takes that sound to get from where my finger's tapping back to me. Uh, then I also have touch. And here again, we're kind of talking about skin receptors, uh, but not in the sense that they're stretching like we talked about before. But the idea that if I'm walking by and I bump against the whiteboard, it activates skin receptors. Something external to me, the whiteboard in this case, has activated those skin receptors. All right, and our last part that I think is really, really cool is this idea of body schema or body form, right? And what we really have here um, is how do, you perceive, how do you perceive your body? How do you perceive that you're moving, right? Well, if we're gonna talk about this, we gotta talk about something called the sensory homunculus. Okay, so in the brain, we have two strips kind of right in the middle, uh, one that is for motor output, so movement, and one that is for sensory input, right? And this idea is that we have this map of our body that kind of looks like this little guy right here, right? So there's a really big face, really big head, really big hands, right? and the rest of his body is pretty small proportionally to those. So if we take this, 
idea of the homunculus and how it's formed that we have really big hands and a really big head uh, representation. Uh, if we take it and we have somebody put a piece of paper over their hand and we have them cover their eyes so they can't see their hand and we ask them to trace their hand on that piece of paper, they're going to perceive their hand as being much bigger just because in the homunculus that representation is much bigger than it actually is. All right, and then to go with this, we have this idea of memory of form. So how do I perceive that I'm moving or standing, right, kind of consciously? So if I, we have somebody, we have people in the gym all the time, we get them in half kneeling or we get them in tall kneeling or standing stuff, and they'll get like this and we'll say, get real tall, and they think that they're standing real tall upright now, right, and they're not. Their shoulders are way back. They got kind of a sway back deal going. Um, and we move them around and we get them actually tall and upright, and they say, oh, that feels like I'm falling forward now. Right, so their memory of form doesn't match up to what's actually happening now. So a lot of times we'll take them to a mirror, right? There's a mirror actually to the side of me here, and we'll have them say, hey, look in the mirror. Why don't you kind of notice how you're standing? And they'll go, oh yeah, I guess I'm not real upright. So their memory is off from what's actually happening. So we can use mirrors or coaching or video feedback to help people with that. And I think it's a really helpful tool, especially in rehab situations, so people can see what's going on. All right, so the next practical part of this uh, is gonna involve extraception, right? We kind of talked about vision and hearing playing a part in proprioception. Uh, that's a really important feedback to me and to Tony here as well. And we're gonna kind of play with it a little bit so you guys can see what happens when we alter it, right? So we got Tony set up in a good split squat. Tony, go ahead and take a breath out. And I'm gonna have you come about a quarter of the way up. He's gonna hold it there. He has his eyes open still. And now we're gonna take that visual input away from him. Go ahead and close your eyes. And we can already see how much he relies on his vision to aid in his proprioception and his movement because he's much more wobbly now, right? Go ahead and relax, Tony. Thank you. Um, and we can actually utilize this to our advantage as well, right? So when we're teaching weightlifters, um, I don't want them to rely on their vision so much as they do feedback from the muscle spindles and the joints. Um, so we'll actually blindfold some of our weightlifters, right, and have them, again, they're just using a light bar. We're not throwing a ton of weight overhead, but blindfold them, have them go through the movements pause, remember what that feels like so they can hit every point throughout their lift when they go to work on them. All right, so in the split squat, we kind of took Tony's vision away um, and saw how much that he relied on it, right? We saw him get a little more wobbly as soon as he closed his eyes. Here, we're gonna actually take that vision away to our advantage, okay? So Tony, go ahead and bang out a few reps of a good RDL. And come right back up. And let's go ahead and do one more real quick. All right. Now we're actually gonna take Tony's vision away, okay? So we're gonna pull his blindfold down, just like a blindfold you would sleep with at night. Um, now, Tony, I want you to go down, pause when you get to your knee, and go ahead and find the sensation on the middle of your foot there. Once you got the middle of your foot and you're steady, go ahead and come back up. All right, so what we've done, we've taken Tony's vision away. Now consciously, he has to be more aware of all these proprioceptive sensations that he's getting internally. So long term, I'm probably not going to keep the blindfold on Tony forever. Uh, we typically use this kind of a warm-up exercise, people that are new to weightlifting. Um, but when Tony does start to add weight on the bar, uh, and he gets more and more comfortable with it, and the movement starts to look fluid, I may actually keep the blindfold on for a few warm-up sets, but he's not going to be doing any maximal lifting, uh, any 5 or 3 RMs or anything crazy. All right, so Tony, go ahead and bang out one more for us. Find the middle of that foot to start. Nice RDL down to the knee. Make sure you got the middle of that foot again. Once you got it, go ahead and come back up. And beautifully done. All right, so we're gonna do a quick example of something that would kind of look like a single leg exercise. Now we can utilize that extraoception, especially that touch in this example, to help somebody with their proprioceptive input, keep them a little more balanced, okay? So we're gonna have Tony pick his foot up off the floor. He's gonna keep his eyes open right now. Tony, go ahead and close your eyes for us. Right, he's going to get a little more wobbly, right? We've taken that vision away from him. Tony, go ahead and reach your left hand out, and I'm going to act like a wall for Tony. Right, he's not really pushing on me. I'm just here as kind of a reference point in space right now. So he's getting a little more feedback with touch. And then I'm going to take that wall away from him so that he doesn't have any more inputs. And we should see him just get a little bit more wobbly now, right? So he has less extraoception, less input. So he's going to have a harder time with his proprioception and staying stable in single leg exercises. 
Thank you, Tony. All right, so now we're going to tie in how does how does fatigue start to affect all this proprioceptive stuff that we talked about, right? Our kinesthesia, our proprioception, and our extraoception. All right, we're really going to break it apart here into concentric versus eccentric muscle action. Uh, it helps us delineate things a little bit better that way. All right, so if we're working muscle concentrically, all we're really getting for a result of fatigue is the byproducts of metabolism. Okay, so our lactate, our hydrogen, all that stuff uh, building up due to concentric muscle actions alters our sense of effort and our sense of force. Right, if you recall from a few minutes ago, we talked about having an efferent copy of that motor program that stays in the brain, right? And when I get that efferent copy, I'm able to compare how hard was this compared to last time or previous times that I've done it. And now if I'm fatigued, it's going to feel much harder, right? We've all experienced this. It came, seems kind of silly, but here's the science behind it now. And if we go over here to our eccentric muscle action, we add one more layer on top of that metabolic byproduct, right? So eccentric muscle action, we have our metabolic by byproducts just like concentric muscle actions, but now we also have muscular damage, right? We're ripping apart sarcomeres, tearing connective tissues apart. Um, and that also alters our sense of effort and force, but add on top of it, we're now starting to change the body schema, right? So if you've ever been injured, you kind of pay more attention consciously to the part of your body that hurts, right? It may nag you all day. You may stand up out of a chair. If you did deadlifts the day before, you may go, oh man, my posterior chain's on fire, right? If we think about our homunculus man again, any part of my body that I pay more attention to due to damage and injury is gonna get exaggerated, right? At least for the time being. So say, again, you did deadlifts, you worked your posterior chain, that posterior chain on the homunculus in the brain it's going to be a little exaggerated for the next few days, right? That alters your body schema then. All right, so here's a deadlift example of how uh, fatigue can actually affect proprioception. So we all know that if we have Tony jump on a trap bar with a bunch of weight, after a few reps, things are probably going to break down. Uh, but we're going to modify that a little bit. So we're going to have him do a few reps with a pretty light trap bar. We've got 80 pounds on the trap bar. Tony, go ahead and bang out three reps for us. I'm going to step around, see how things are going. First one looked beautiful. Second one's still good. And last one, just as good as the first two. Okay, now we're gonna take this light trap bar out of here, give Tony way more weight. And I'm basically just gonna have Tony go until he can't do any more trap bar deadlifts right now, okay? So Tony on you whenever you're ready. <clears throat> and so the first one looks about the same. Keep him going, Tony. And as soon as he gets fatigued here, we're going to get the light trap bar again. Let's see if it looks different even with the light weight. Nice job, Tony. Let's go. Let's hit one more and then we'll bring this light bar back in. <clears throat> All right. Then we're going to have him jump back into this light bar real quick. See if things look a little bit different now that he's fatigued, even though we're using just 80 pounds here. So we see his hips aren't rising anymore. He's not pushing through the floor, right? So that fatigue changed his sense of effort, which changes proprioception and how he thinks that he's moving around. And you're good, Tony. Thank you. All right, last part of our fatigue talk here, and then we'll move on to how injury affects proprioception. Then we'll kind of recap things, right? But we just talked about fatigue alters position sense via a bunch of different mechanisms, right? Muscular damage with eccentric muscle actions, as well as metabolic byproducts with eccentric and concentric muscle actions. Right, so to combat fatigue, so we can hold on to position sense for a little bit longer throughout our game or throughout our workout or our client's workouts, right, is I wanna control the volume first of all, right? It's, to me, it's just ridiculous to have people doing sets of 10 or 12 power cleans or snatches or snatches from the floor right um, because we know as soon as fatigue sets in that's going to alter their their sense of effort and their position sense and if that happens our increase for injury goes up uh, they're probably going to miss more lifts they're going to ingrain bad patterns over time right so if we can control the volume we give them a little bit of graded exposure right so we make the exercise a little bit harder and we challenge them a little bit more each time um, we can alter their sense of effort as well as their metabolic byproduct buildup. Right, and then our byproducts to end with here 
our cardiovascular development and our work capacity. And if we can increase both of those things, we can get rid of the byproducts that are in the muscle via, from metabolism a little bit quicker. And then again, we just talked about if we can get rid of those byproducts, I uh, control position sense for a little bit longer throughout that workout or throughout that game, and I decrease the risk for injury. All right, last part here, we're gonna talk about how prior injury can affect proprioception as well. Uh, and then we'll kind of recap everything we talked about real quick and then talk about maybe some ways to apply it to finish up, right? So if we look at functionally stable and functionally unstable ankles, however the researchers quantify that, um, there's actually not a difference in the soft tissue ability or the laxity of the soft tissues to move. But what we do see is there's a difference in the amount of movement that's needed at the ankle to get proprioceptive feedback from the receptors that we've talked about. Right, so in our functionally unstable ankle group, their foot may invert 10 degrees, and then when they hit 12 degrees, they start getting some feedback from those receptors. But our stable group, they may get to three or four degrees, and then they start getting feedback from those receptors. Right, so they start to detect movement at lower forces, and they start to detect movement earlier via those receptors in the ankle. Right, so again, it's not a, a soft tissue issue here, but it is how well their proprioceptors, right, their joint receptors, their GTOs, their Golgi tendon organs, sense movement. And if they're not able to sense the movement, they can't correct it very quickly. Now that leads to unstable ankles, right? So our unstable ankle, our unstable joint, typically isn't from this tissue being different. It's uh, the inability for the sensory organs in the ankle to give us feedback quick enough so that we can make corrections. All right, so just to wrap things up here, uh, kind of what we talked about over the last little bit, right, is this idea of position sense. We're gonna have three big things that add to my position sense. We're gonna have our proprioception, which is how are my joints and my body segments related to one each other, or to one another? How, how are they moving in relation to one another? Right, kinesthesia, we talked about. Now, what are the forces doing? How am I moving throughout space? And how are my limbs moving in relation to one another? And then our extraception are these external cues in the environment where I'm getting feedback from other senses so I can have a better idea of where I'm at in space and what my body's doing, right? So all three of these combined give us our position sense. And we also talked about injury and fatigue and how fatigue affects all of this, right? So if we can reduce fatigue, we essentially save somebody's ability to know where they're at in space and know what they're doing. So if we can control fatigue via the appropriate amounts of training and rest, we keep their position sense. And if we can control the volume throughout their workouts and cycles, again, we save their position sense. That also reduces their risk for injuries, right? And lastly here, uh, something that I think is really, really cool is the use of mirrors and videos. We talked about body schema, the idea of people may not know where they're at or how they're standing or how their body's positioned, okay? So we talked about if I have somebody that comes in and they're in half kneeling or tall kneeling and they go, we say, all right, get upright. And they go like this and say, okay, I think I'm pretty upright. Right? If we can use a mirror or we show them a video of themselves doing an exercise, they may be able to realize, oh, hey, that's not upright really. And we put them here and they may actually feel like they're falling forward a little bit until they realize, oh, hey, look in the mirror. Here we are. Now I can see that I'm actually upright and they can recreate that body schema in their own mind, okay? So again, control fatigue, we can control proprioception and position sense, and we limit people's potential for injury. Hey guys, thanks for checking out the video on proprioception this month. Hopefully it makes you realize that there's more to proprioception than just little muscle spindles inside the muscle and some magic happens inside your body and you know where you are in space. Uh, hopefully it also gives you some ideas of how you can tweak exercises or cue your clients a little bit differently in the gym. If you have other ideas or have questions, bring them to the Facebook page. Hopefully we'll have a good conversation there. Uh, we look forward to it. Thank you.